Welcome back to Sissy Maya. Make sure to subscribe to our channel to never miss an update. Additionally, consider subscribing to my Patreon to get access to these features, and much more. Katie looked down at me, her grin widening. Well, Emma, here's the scoop. You're now a little baby girl, all safely tucked into your cot so you won't get into any mischief. But this isn't just a quick overnight stay, oh no. We're leaving you here until tomorrow afternoon. Since it's Sunday, there's no school, so we have plenty of time to handle you at our leisure. Actually, we could keep you here until Monday morning if we wanted. Now, you know what often makes babies cry? It's when they wet or soil their nappies. Of course, you can't cry because of that big dummy keeping you quiet, but I don't blame babies for crying. Imagine lying there helplessly with a wet or dirty nappy, all those yucky things causing nappy rash and discomfort. She paused, looking at me with a mischievous smile. I know what you're thinking. You might wet your nappy, but you'll never do a poo in it. Well, I've got a surprise for you. The amount of water you drank ensures you'll wet your nappy, but what you don't know is those chocolate flakes on top of the mousse were grated laxative chocolate. Yes, she chuckled. I guarantee that by tomorrow morning, all four of you will have very full nappies, and Matron is quite certain you'll also develop a very sore case of nappy rash. You'll be surprised how much those wet and dirty nappies will sting your skin after so many hours. It should be a nice reminder of your punishment. She stepped back as the girls erupted in giggles. I was utterly stunned. Oh God, what a fate. All four sturdy cots began to tremble slightly as Ted and I strained helplessly against our restraints. It was futile. There was no way any of us could even hope to overturn these solid wooden prisons. Instinctively, I attempted to shout in protest, wriggling furiously from side to side in a desperate attempt to free myself. But Matron had secured us too well. I couldn't move, and all that escaped behind my dummy was a muffled mmpmmfmmm as humiliation brought tears to my eyes. Oh look, Susan remarked, she's crying, just like a proper little baby. She leaned in, speaking to me in baby talk, there, there, Didums, do you want to get out of your cot? I don't think so. You're here for the long haul, my little sister. Her broad smile of satisfaction said it all. Gradually, I ceased my futile struggling, realizing its uselessness and knowing it only entertained the girls. Eventually, the room quieted to soft giggles. Matron headed towards the door, announcing, All right, everyone, I think it's time for you to head home. Let's leave baby Emma and her little friends to settle down for the night. Don't worry about them, they'll be perfectly safe. I'll be sleeping in the adjoining room, so I'm here if needed. With a lingering smile and a final giggle, the girls reluctantly began to depart. Katie and Megan approached my cot, peering down at my helpless figure. I glared back at them over my dummy. Katie grinned, remarking, Well, there you are, Ethan. Now you get to experience the most exquisite humiliation. Imagine, filling your nappy and having to lie in it for hours, while it squelches and squidges around your soaked bottom. The best part. There's absolutely nothing you can do to stop it. As I told the others, I just wish Diana and Trisha could be here to witness this wonderful revenge for all your past misdeeds. They'd love it. But don't worry, they'll hear all about it soon. Glancing at her watch, she added, All right then, we'll leave you be. See you tomorrow. Night night, baby Emma. Have fun. With a parting giggle and a wave, they were gone. I lay quietly, listening to the sounds from outside the room. Soon, I heard the girls bidding Matron farewell, and then silence fell. After a short while, Matron returned with bedding. She came over to my cot, smiling warmly. Well, Emma, she said softly, time to say goodnight. Let's get you tucked in. Lowering one side of the cot, she placed a small pillow under my head and spread a pastel pink duvet adorned with baby rabbits over me. After tucking it in snugly, she raised the side of the cot again. She attended to the others in turn until we were all snugly tucked in. There we go, my little ones, she said gently, all tucked in and safe. I'll be in my room with the door open, 
so all you can do now is lie there and endure your punishment. I must say, sometimes I surprise myself with my creativity. Night night, little ones. I'll leave the small lamp on. She crossed to a chest of drawers, switched on a small table lamp with a pink shade, then turned off the main light and departed through the door to her quarters. I lay there quietly for a while, but eventually, the urge to break free overwhelmed me. I started to heave and strain against my restraints, wriggling and squirming in frustration. Despite my efforts, all I could manage was a faint, babyish gurgle I couldn't move or make any louder sound. It was hopeless. Gradually, I gave up struggling and lay there, panting with exhaustion and frustration. Every now and then, one of the others would attempt the same, but with no success. We were completely helpless. Slowly, I began to relax a bit, realizing that fighting against the restraints only made things worse. I supposed that eventually, sleep might come, if possible at all. Time dragged on slowly, and without any view of daylight from our enclosed room, I had no idea of the hour. The only light was the soft glow of the table lamp. After a couple of hours, I heard muted, baby-like gurgles from the others as they sucked on their dummies. Gradually, I felt the pressure in my bladder build. Initially, I managed to hold it in, driven perhaps by pride to avoid wetting my nappy like an infant. I gritted my teeth against the increasing discomfort, grunting with the effort. But nature won out. As the pain in my bladder intensified, my muscles finally yielded. Urine flooded into my nappy, the warm liquid seeping into every crease of my skin and trickling down to my bottom. Despite the circumstances, I couldn't help but emit a muffled groan of relief as my bladder emptied. For a while, I lay there in a state of relaxation, but the humiliation of being helplessly dressed as a baby in a wet nappy weighed heavily on my mind. Could anything be more degrading? I wondered. I was about to discover the answer. Time passed slowly, the soft pink glow of the lamp casting a warm ambience. Eventually, exhaustion caught up with me, and I drifted into a fitful sleep. It had been an emotionally draining day. Occasionally, I would awaken briefly, only to drift off again soon after. Then it began. I woke to the sound of the others moaning into their dummies. A loud gurgling started in my bowels, and I felt movement. Wide awake now, I tried to guess the time it must have been around six in the morning. I couldn't help but focus on what was happening. The bowel movements repeated about every ten minutes, growing more frequent and intense as the powerful laxatives took effect. Suddenly, I felt the urgent need to relieve myself, but I was determined to resist at all costs. And so began my desperate struggle. I tried desperately to clench my buttocks and bring my knees together, but Matron had cleverly secured my legs apart, preventing any such movement. Like the others, I writhed more desperately in my restraints, trying to fight against the inexorable movement down through my bowels toward my bottom. I became frantic in my struggle, but the baby reins and straps held me firmly in place. Finally, nature took its course, and I let out a muffled cry of humiliation into my dummy as an uncontrollable flood of waste oozed into my nappy. It was awful. Tears welled up in my eyes as the warm, sticky mess spread around my bottom and inside the nappy. I lay there quietly sobbing for a few minutes. But it wasn't over. The gurgling continued, and every so often, another burst of waste would escape uncontrollably into my nappy. I could feel the nappy squelching around my bottom with every movement. I lay there drained of emotion for the next few hours. But eventually, everything comes to an end. After what felt like an eternity, I heard voices outside, and moments later, the door opened and Matron, Katie, Megan, and their friends entered. They gathered around my cot, grinning broadly down at me. Well, well, Matron said, I think little Emma has certainly filled her nappy, judging by the look of her. She looked at me and asked, Have you made a mess in your nappy, Emma? Emma m -m 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 -ph. I replied convincingly. Excellent. Matron said, turning to one of the girls. Sue, I think it's best if some of you leave the room for a few minutes while we clean up our babies. It's not pleasant, but I'm used to it. Yes, I understand, Sue replied, 
holding her nose with a grimace. We'll take a short walk. I assume five of you can manage to clean each baby one at a time? Exactly, matron confirmed. Give us about an hour. Four of the girls exited the room, leaving Katie, Megan, and Sue to prepare for our cleanup. Matron lowered the cot bars and began to release me. I stood up, albeit unsteadily. Now, matron instructed, pointing to a door at the end of the room, there's a small toilet and shower through there. Go in, remove all your clothes, and dispose of the dirty nappy and plastic pants in the large rubbish bag. Then take a shower and let me know when you're dry. Leave your baby clothes in a heap in the corner, I'll take care of them later. I didn't need to be told twice. Grateful to be free, I shuffled into the shower room and quickly shed the now foul-smelling baby clothes. Carefully wrapping the stinky nappy in one bag inside another to contain the odor, I then cleaned myself as best I could with toilet paper before flushing it down the toilet. Afterward, I took a long, hot shower. As the warm water cascaded over me, I let out a cry of pain as a sharp sting spread across my bottom I had forgotten about the nappy rash. The pain gradually eased, and I dried myself gingerly before wrapping a towel around me. Returning to the nursery, I found the girls and matron near Mike's cot, teasing him. Katie turned to me and said, we've decided to release them later so they can suffer a bit more. Meanwhile, I have something special planned for you. The ominous tone in her voice sent a shiver down my spine. It dawned on me suddenly I had no clothes to wear home. What am I supposed to wear? I asked, almost pleadingly. The girls glanced at each other. Katie grinned mischievously and replied, Oh, don't worry, dear brother. I brought some nice clean clothes for you from home. We're going to dress you in your Sunday best. Come over here, and let's get you ready. Reluctantly, I approached Katie as she emptied her bag, laying out underclothes and a pale yellow dress on the cot where I had slept. My heart sank, I realized my ordeal wasn't over yet. Now, before we dress you, Emma, matron intervened, bend over. I complied, and she observed, as I suspected, a classic case of nappy rash. Would you like some ointment? Yes, please, I answered. Matron took a tube of ointment, squeezed out a generous amount into her hand, and instructed, bend over that chair, Emma. Katie and Megan held me down over a chair with my bottom exposed. At that moment, I should have sensed something was amiss, but it was too late. As soon as I was held down in position, Matron put her hand on my bottom and began to rub the ointment well in. In a few seconds I felt a searing pain spread across my bottom, and I screamed in agony. It wasn't soothing skin cream. Oh no. It was full-strength deep heat ointment, and the pain brought tears to my eyes. The girls burst out laughing and let me go, and I desperately tried to rub off the ointment from my bottom, but that just made things worse. Matron gave me a cloth to wipe my hands as the pain subsided slightly, but I realized that I was going to have a very sore bottom for several days to come. Well she chuckled, that was fun, wasn't it? Don't worry, it won't last forever. Just a little souvenir from your night in a dirty nappy. Now let's get you dressed little girl. She picked up a pair of pale yellow knickers and held them out for me to step into. Right she said, in you get. I obediently stepped into them, and she pulled them up to my waist. This was followed by a white vest, which she tucked into my knickers. Katie then picked up the dress and held it up for Matron to admire. Oh that is pretty smiled Matron, delightful for a little eight-year-old, but humiliating for a girl of twelve, let alone a boy of twelve. With a groan I recognized it as one of the party dresses that Katie used to wear, and it looked as if it was now my turn to wear it. It was a primrose yellow frock, and was everybody's idea of what a little girl would wear, with a Peter Pan collar, short puffed sleeves and a pretty smocking pattern across the front. It had a row of buttons up the back, and a sash belt that tied in a large bow at the back. Arms up Emma said matron. I raised my arms resignedly, and she put them into the sleeves and pulled the frock down over my head. Then she fastened all the buttons up my back and tied the sash in a neat non-slip bow behind me. I stood there for a moment, fingering the frock with distaste as I realized that it fitted me perfectly. My feet were next. 
Sitting me down on a chair first, she took a pair of white cotton ankle socks from a drawer, pulled them onto my feet, and turned the tops down neatly. Then came a pair of white leather sandals of a suitably babyish design, with buckles at the side of the foot. Pushing them onto my feet, she fastened the straps tightly. They were obviously not meant to come off. Now then said Matron, what next? I think you can take over at this point can't you Katie? Oh yes, Katie grinned mischievously. Sit down on the cot, Emma, and hold out your hands in fists. Anticipating a repeat of yesterday's humiliation, I realized resistance was futile, so I complied obediently. Katie took a roll of white adhesive strapping tape and wound it tightly around each clenched fist, rendering them immobile. She then retrieved the white woolen mittens from the previous day and slipped them over my hands, securing them with built-in pink ribbons that she tied tightly around my wrists in a neat double bow. With each step, I felt increasingly powerless. Next, Katie picked up the pink leather baby reins adorned with baby rabbits and three small bells sewn onto the front, which I had worn overnight. She slipped my head and arms through the straps, buckling them securely behind me. With my hands bound, I knew there was no way to free myself from them. Almost there, Megan chimed in. But there are a couple more things to complete your transformation. She fetched my baby's dummy from the cot, adjusting the securing ribbons as she approached. Now, Megan instructed, open wide. Understanding that resistance was futile with the other's help, I tentatively complied. Megan pushed the large silicone rubber bulb of the dummy deep into my mouth, pressing down on my tongue. She wound the ribbons tightly around my head several times before tying them securely in a knot behind my head. The oversized rubber bulb silenced me completely, in the most humiliating manner possible. Right, Katie declared, let's tend to your hair next. She retrieved my wig from the cot, holding it up for me to inspect. Though I had worn it the day before, I hadn't had a chance to examine it closely. Katie grinned knowingly, matching my thoughts. The wig was light brown, matching my natural hair color, styled in a pageboy cut with two distinct bunches, each tied with noticeable white hair ribbons and pink plastic hair slides. Keep your head still, Megan instructed, positioning the wig carefully on my head. She pulled the elastic strap down in front of my face and under my chin, brushing the wig into place. I particularly like the chin strap idea, Katie remarked to Matron, no matter how much he tries to shake it off, he won't be able to dislodge that wig. She grinned at me, noting, those hair ribbons complement the baby frock so well. Megan even brought some lovely pale yellow ones to match your dress. How thoughtful of her. Let's switch them out. Katie replaced the white bows and pink slides with pale yellow hair ribbons and clips, securing them firmly. There, Megan smiled upon finishing, you look as pretty as a picture, little girl. Just one more thing, and you'll be all set. She took hold of two wrist straps, buckling them securely around my wrists. Crossing my arms behind my back, she fastened them together across my waist with another strap, clipping it onto the D-rings of my wrist restraints. Pulling the front strap tight through a central buckle, she secured it, effectively immobilizing my arms in front of my waist. Stepping back to admire her handiwork, Megan grinned and remarked, There we are, one little girl all set for the next part of her punishment. She guided me aside for the other girls to inspect, their laughter filling the room. Isn't she just adorable? Megan chuckled. The next part is going to be absolutely priceless. Have you filled him in yet? A dreadful suspicion crept over me as I realized they were planning to take me out dressed like this, and my fears were soon confirmed. Megan retrieved a four-foot-long pink leather strap and clipped each end to a D-ring attached to the back of my baby reins. With my arms rendered helpless, I was completely under her control. Matron glanced at me with a smile. Well, I must say, you girls have come up with quite the ultimate punishment for any young lad. He must be squirming inside, dressed like that. You're really going to take him out for a walk? Absolutely, Katie declared. I've been waiting for this moment for years. He's tormented me since forever. Well, I think this will certainly give him and his friends pause for thought in the future, Matron grinned. 
So, what's the plan once you get him outside? Oh, don't worry, Katie whispered to Matron. We've got it all figured out. Here's what we'll be doing later. Matron nodded with amusement. Ah, yes, that sounds perfect. It should humiliate him quite nicely. Are we all set then? Yes, Katie affirmed, gripping my reins. Come along, Emma. Megan and I are taking you for a nice long stroll. I mumbled a protest into my dummy, but it was futile. Katie and Megan took hold of my arms, joined by two more girls, and together they marched me toward the school's front door, leaving my friends behind in their cots, at the mercy of Matron and the others. As Katie opened the door, she glanced up at the sky and remarked, Looks like rain soon. We'd better grab our raincoats. While she held me firmly by the reins, the other girls went to fetch their coats. It was clear now that I was going out whether I wanted to or not. Megan's raincoat was a red rubberized cotton Macintosh with a buckle belt and an attached hood hanging down her back. Katie wore a stylish royal blue PVC raincoat fastened with a row of press studs down the front and a tightly secured buckle belt around her waist. Her raincoat also sported an attached hood with tie tapes cascading over her shoulders. All right, Megan said, almost ready. But of course, our little toddler girl needs something too, don't you think? We can't have her getting wet if it rains. She crossed to a coat rack and fetched a red rubberized rain cape, draping it over her arm. We'll put this on her soon, she grinned, but let's show off her adorable baby frock first. And her lovely baby reins and those pretty bows in her hair, another girl chimed in, laughing. Let's go then, Megan declared. Gripping the strap attached to my reins, she and Katie led me through the door. I tried to shout in protest, but with the dummy securely in my mouth, all that came out was a muffled MMFMMP as I was dragged down the school driveway and onto the pavement beyond. I blushed deeply as I immediately drew the attention of passers-by, who wasted no time in teasing me once the girls explained why I was dressed like this, with some embellishments that I couldn't deny due to the dummy. We walked for about half an hour until we reached a footpath leading across the fields. All right, this spot will do, Megan decided. Let's head down to the village. Gripping my reins firmly, she began to lead me along the path, occasionally tugging them to keep me in line like a toddler. The bells on my reins tinkled with each movement, intensifying my embarrassment. Unfortunately, the paved path was busy with people who found my situation amusing, but none intervened, they simply laughed and continued on their way. After we had been walking for about an hour, my heart sank as I spotted three teenage girls heading straight towards us. As they approached, we all paused, and their eyes locked onto me, followed by bursts of laughter. Clearly, they knew my sister and her friends. Well, isn't this a sight, giggled one of them. How did you manage to get him to go along with this? Megan proceeded to explain the reason behind my punishment, but I tried to interject instinctively. With the oversized dummy firmly secured in my mouth, all that came out were muffled sounds like ump, mmf, um. This only made them laugh even harder, and I endured several minutes of teasing and jesting from the girls. Just then, the rain began to fall, prompting the girls to pull up their raincoat hoods and secure them tightly under their chins. The others wore full-length translucent plastic Macs with bow-tied belts at the front, also securing their hoods with tie tapes. Now, let's keep baby Emma dry, grinned Katie. After neatly tucking the lead rein out of the way behind my back, she unfurled the red rubberized rain cape and draped it over my shoulders. She buttoned it up all the way to the top and finally pulled the pointed pixie hood over my head, fastening it securely with a button under my chin. The hood was impossible for me to dislodge, leaving me peering out demurely, just like a little girl. At the sight of me, one of the girls chuckled and remarked, Oh my goodness, you look absolutely adorable. Another added, He could pass for my little sister, especially with that sweet pixie hood framing his face. I'd love to walk him home like this, would you? Megan responded. Well, let's go then. Oh, that sounds hilarious, exclaimed one of the girls gleefully, and off we went along the path. Now, my anxiety peaked. Being dressed in such a helpless manner, 
completely at the mercy of my sister and her mischievous teenage friends, filled me with dread. I attempted once more to voice my protest, but all that managed to escape was a quiet, um, MMMMP. Their ensuing laughter and giggles were utterly unbearable. Now then, Katie announced, it's about six miles to the village from here, so we'll need a couple of hours. Come along, Emma, she said, grinning at me. Enjoy your walk and no dawdling. Two of the girls grasped my shoulders and guided me along, completely under their control. We marched through the pouring rain, the drumming sound echoing on my hood and shoulders, while rivulets cascaded down onto my feet ensconced in little white ankle socks and Mary Jane shoes. The hem of the Macintosh rain cape flapped against my bare legs, giving me a taste of why young girls might despise wearing them. The scent of rubber permeated my senses as the interior of the cape grew damp and clammy from a mix of rain and perspiration. Despite the cool weather, I found myself uncomfortably warm under the moistened rubberized cotton. Unsurprisingly, the girls relished every moment of the walk, with me serving as the target of numerous humiliating remarks. Around halfway back to the village, the rain finally ceased, prompting the girls to lower the hoods of their plastic macs. Katie unfastened my cape, once again exposing my embarrassing attire. She carried the cape over her arm while Megan took a firm hold of my reins, leading me onward toward the village. They continued to giggle as they paraded me along the footpath, adorned in my baby frock, ribbons in my hair, and the white ankle socks and t-bar shoes strapped to my feet. Before long, we entered the main street of the village, where I squirmed with humiliation as they paraded me up and down, fully visible to everyone. Any inquiries from passers-by were met with straightforward explanations from the girls, which provided me with no comfort whatsoever. Eventually, the girls tired of their amusement, and Katie decided it was time to take me home, another two miles away. She draped the rain cape over me again, buttoning the hood, and we set off on our way back. After enduring a final humiliating stroll, with the laughter of every passerby ringing in my ears, we arrived at our front door. Mum greeted us as she opened it, chuckling broadly. Well, well, she laughed, has little Emma finally found her way home? Come on into the lounge. I complied, relieved when Katie finally removed my dummy, but I had to sit there, still clad in my damp rain cape with the hood up, for another couple of hours. Eventually, the moment of release arrived, but there was one last task to endure. Now, Emma, said Katie, before I let you go, I want to capture some souvenir photos. Despite my protests, she lowered my hood, firmly secured the dummy back in my mouth, and then raised the hood again. Leading me out into the garden, she proceeded to take a series of photographs, some with the rain cape and others without. After capturing the photos, we returned indoors, and she escorted me upstairs to change. With care, she released all my restraints and assisted me in shedding the baby clothes. Once free, I quickly dressed back into my own attire. Descending once more to the living room, Mum prepared tea. Amidst conversation, Megan turned to me and remarked, Well, Ethan, how did you find that? It was awful, I admitted. I've never felt so embarrassed in my life. I wouldn't want to go through that again. Oh, but you see, that's where you're mistaken. Megan grinned mischievously. With the cute photos we took, I think you'll be visiting many of my friends for a variety of delightful humiliations we have planned for you. You wouldn't dare, I gasped, breath-catching. You couldn't. We can, and we will, Katie asserted evenly. Imagine what your schoolmates would think of those photos. Maybe we should start by posting some on the school notice board. Or how about the school magazine? Wouldn't that be amusing? Horrified, I realized she had me trapped. Yes, my dear brother, Katie smirked triumphantly. You'll find yourself in our care on many occasions to come, paying for all those times you gave us a hard time, especially me. Oh, and one more thing, mum's on board after I showed her my list of all the nasty things you've done, so don't expect her to bail you out. Turning to Megan, Katie continued, So, when's the next session? Well then, Ethan, or should I say Emma, Megan teased. I expect you at my place in two weeks. This time, perhaps we'll take you out again dressed as a baby, 
securely strapped into your pram. Or maybe we'll opt for a leisurely stroll in our school uniforms during sports day. We're looking forward to it. By now, tears of impending humiliation threatened to spill. Megan reveled in my discomfort. All right then, she said. Katie will bring you over in two weeks. I suggest you show up if you don't want those photos plastered on your workplace notice board. Be here around noon. Opening the door, she bid a solemn goodbye as she walked away down the path. I felt utterly trapped, uncertain how long this torment would continue. I pondered how many more times I'd be parading through the village dressed as a sweet little girl. Katie's ingenuity in humiliating me seemed boundless. Helpless, I resigned myself to the inevitable. She had me exactly where she wanted, and I had no choice but to endure whatever came next. One thing was certain it would be purgatory for me, but sheer delight for my sister and her friends.